So I'm billed to speak about Lindisfarne. However, we haven't actually started work on Lindisfarne yet. So I thought I should talk about something we, where we have been carrying out field work, which is with David's agreement, which is with, on the uh, Flodden 500 project, which is a project set up um, really in, by Northumberland County Council to look at the, and commemorate the Battle of Flodden in 1513. Uh, it was originally set up by Chris Burgess, working with Chris Bowles of uh, Scottish Borders Council. Um, our involvement was really to look at some of the peripheral sites to the actual battle site itself. So Chris Burgess, working with John Nolan, has been working on um, Flodden Hill, which is the, the site of the Scottish encampment, and also on Flodden Field, or Braxton uh, Field, which is the site of the battle itself. Uh, with, as I'm sure they'd be prepared to admit, limited results in terms of identifying actual uh, 1513 material. Uh, we've been working, as I said, on peripheral sites, mainly at um, Norham Castle and Wark Castle, but also at Ellenford, one of the Scottish mustering sites up the Witter Valley. Um, we've been doing that work since 2013, I think, and yesterday was the very last uh, excavation that we're going to carry out, or at least I hope, uh, on the Flodden project. Uh, I'll tell you about that um, a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly now about what we carried out towards the back end of last year at Norham and Wark Castles, and work that we've been carrying out this year, which is designed to complement and hopefully enhance the, the, the excellent work that um, David's been carrying out in, this, in the documentary field. Uh, excellent. So, I'm, I'm going to have to rattle through this quite quickly in order to get on to Lindisfarne at the very end. And I'm going to say something about Lindisfarne merely as an advertisement for the work that we're proposing to carry out there from this summer and going into next. So, the Flodden Project, uh, Flodden 500, commemorating the 500th anniversary of the battle in 1513, um, we looked in, um, at the two castles, as I mentioned, that the Scots took in 1513 ahead of the, the battle itself. Um, there were two of the major, two of the three English castles on the Tweed, or the major ones anyway, Norham Walk, and the other one was Berwick, which they didn't get to. Um, they took Norham and Walk. Um, it's presumed that they bombarded, besieged Norham Castle from Ladykirk on the opposite bank. So we excavated in the two positions, well, we, we carried out geophysics. I say we, this, is, this was Chris Burgess really doing all this work. Um, we carried out geophysics and then subsequently excavation within the areas marked in purple on the top uh, map there. Um, and also further to the west in, in Lady Kirk village itself. Um, the excavation sites around Norham Castle are marked in red, in very small dots, admittedly, but I hope you can see just about that they're on and around earthworks on the south side <coughs> of the, the castle, um, in an area which it's supposed, or, well, it's hypothesized, may have been used as a sort of extra, extra mural ward to the, to the castle itself. So perhaps an, an area not heavily fortified, but used during times of particular need um, during times when troops were massing, when you needed encampment, when you needed a place to carry out light, light industrial activities, armament making, that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's all on the south side of the castle, which is in turn is on the south side of the Tweed. Uh, going, uh, these are merely the, the highlights. You may not think they're highlights, but they are the highlights of, of the excavations. Um, this was a, a deep trench excavated on the side of a, uh, a hollowway, which led up to sort of major earthworks on the south side of the, of the, the castle. Um, it's one of the rules of archaeology, archaeological excavation, the unwritten rules, is that the spoil heap is always in the position that you want to expand your trench into. And another rule is that um, interesting <coughs> slots turn out to be uh, 19th century drainage uh, uh, slots. And in, in this case, we found remnants of uh, metalling with medieval and early post-medieval pottery, but unfortunately a drainage ditch had been cut right the way through the middle of it, which we found right at the end of the, the operation, of course. Um, 
Um, on, unfortunately, we only gained scheduled money consent for the last half of this operation. And when we looked at uh, a position of a supposed sort of battery or bastion uh, in on the south side, just opposite the castle, um, we found it being uh, reused for 18th, 17th, 18th century housing. So there's some nice kind of 18th century barrack slipware uh, pottery there to, to prove it. Um, we didn't find any sign of any kind of military installations uh, directly opposite the castle on either of the two major bastions. We did, however, and that is the research committee um, examining some, um, some post holes, uh, possible post holes, shall I say, um, outside the village of Norham. There you can see in the background. Um, we, fa- we found remnants of possible military activity in several of the trenches, but really nothing that could be tied down to any um, specific date and nothing really very substantial, um, and certainly not as substantial as would allow that kind of interpretation, which obviously would arise from you know, lots of small post holes dotted around a trench. Um, but we presume that, you know, that the, it, it is presumed that the, the Scots got fairly close to the castle, um, if not on the, south, on the north side of the river, then perhaps, also, perhaps to the west of the castle on the south side, and you know, would in that case have erected that sort of those sort of um, gabions in order to protect their sort of besieging position. But I think that's a little bit t- certainly tenuous and way beyond the bounds of credibility to present anything like that as a reasonable interpretation. Um, it's more likely, in fact, that what we found were the remnants of um, English refortifications of the castle post Flodden in the 1520s, 30s. It's recorded that you know there was substantial refortification. As a, as a military fortress by the English. So I think what we were finding was uh, material from that period, English refortification, and then subsequent um, domestic occupation of the site after it's abandoned in the 16th century, late 16th century. So over to Wark Castle. We, you can see the castle, the, the keep there to the right of this um, picture. We looked at a plateau area, a big field essentially, with remnant rig and furrow to the west of the castle keep at Wark. Um, the trenches that were excavated, and there were, there were more than I'm showing here, uh, were excavated in 2013, right to 2015, um, on the basis of geophysical survey, which showed various anomalies, as geophysical survey always does, not necessarily to any effect, but and in this case, um, that, was, that was borne out, unfortunately. Um, all of the trenches, or most of the trenches, certainly the ones I'm showing here, showed some sign of medieval um, occupation in terms of what we interpreted it as um, a, a giant campsite, really. I think that that's the best interpretation with outside hearths. Not much evidence for any um, structures other than the ones I'm about to show you and very little evidence for anything specifically military. What we did find, however, oh, I need to, I'll just say that if you look to the very far left, which is the west side of the area that we were uh, interested in, you'll see St. Giles's chapel site of marked uh, with its graveyard, which continued in use into the 18th century and is the presumed site of the walk um, chapel, which is, which is referred to occasionally, sporadically, I think, in the medieval period. Um, it contains um, an earthwork remnant of the chapel itself in the northern part of the graveyard. Um, but if you look to the south of that, you've got Gillies Nick, and, um, which is part, which is, a, which is a nick, a hole, a gap in the natural cane, which is this sort of natural moraine earthwork that runs east to west alongside the road there, on the north side of the road. Um, it then turn or an earthwork then turns off it at Gillies Nick to the north and extends right over to the almost to the River Tweed. And we examined that um, by means of Trench One, which you can see there. So Trench One produced this um, a great big revetment wall, in fact two revetment walls, earth filled, so um, uh, which had then been buttressed by further buttressed by um, piling earth on both sides. So what you had here was a giant earthwork extending north-south. A survey, the survey, border survey of 1541, talks about 
extending the castle. Again, post Flodden talks about extending the castle as far west as it already existed to the east. And if you look on a, a map, then our earthwork is at a point about as far west as the castle already extended to the east. So this may be um, a, you know, it's suggested that they actually began, the English, that is, began to enact what was recommended in 1541 and actually built this big earthwork to the west of the <coughs> castle according to the recommendations post flodden So that's what we think we've got there. And we also have, there is reused medieval masonry, nicely dressed stone within it. Um, north of the chapel I talked about, St. Giles's, there we put in a couple of random trenches, actually. We didn't have any geophysical evidence to support anything there, but we found an area of large, deep pits, up to three and a half meters long, um, over a meter deep. Some of them on the right hand side there show evidence of some structures within them, at least some post holes, you know, perhaps holding up the sides or whatever. No sign of wicker work or anything like that. Our best guess for these, and they're, they're outside the extent of the earthwork I was just talking about, um, which you can just see beyond the figures in the distance there in the central photograph. Our best guess is that these were giant latrine pits, and essentially that this area had been used again as a kind of extra outer ward in times of dire need, when you've got you know, large numbers of soldiers, perhaps in their tens of thousands, uh, occupying the site. Um, but we don't know. We, just, we, just, um, we don't know what they are. We try to find possible industrial interpretations for them to do with salmon fishing or salmon curing or something like that, but we can't find any, um, any suggestions would be welcome. Um, it's curious that these are situated so close to St. Giles's Chapel. Um, that simply adds to the mystery. So on to the routeways project, which I've been working on um, with David. And um, any attempt to draw all of the potential routeways used by the Scottish Army or members of the Scottish Army on a map would lead to something approaching mayhem and chaos. Because virtually, if you think virtually every, people would be sending soldiers from virtually every single small farmstead, you know, as far as the, the far north of Scotland and northwest of Scotland, and so you'd end up colouring in all of the roads ever, ever used historically in Scotland, and certainly all the ones that appear on, the, on Roy's map and subsequent um, maps like the Ordnance Survey. So that's a best guess, working with David, uh, according to suggest some of the major routes that may have been used. And we simply, we sim as David has probably already pointed out, we simply don't know. We don't have very good evidence, direct evidence for 1513, but we've got good evidence for um, campaigns immediately before and after. Um, so what we decided to do in 2016, having found very little direct evidence for the battle on the battle site itself or anywhere else, we decided to take um, a look at some sites and buildings that we knew to have been in existence or thought very likely to have been in existence in 1513 just to see could we find any evidence for um, preferably for some sort of military activity but any kind of activity would do to be honest um, in the early 16th century so these are the sites that um, we chose interesting the last speaker talked about Spottiswood we did look at Spottiswood I'm not going to talk about Spottiswood here because we found the, a possible battle house you know, defensible farmhouse there to be a kind of 19th century um, dwelling with nice sort of a multicolored tiled floor. So less of that. Um, I'm not going to read all that out. These um, on the grounds that many of the buildings that um, were in existence in 1513 were ecclesiastical. And I think ecclesiastical structures <coughs> would have acted as a, a magnet, uh, particularly for a straggling army going home uh, if not an army approaching Florin itself, um, we, we decided to look at, uh, at churches. And as you know, there are many, many, many ruined medieval churches uh, in the Scottish borders. And we went around uh, a fair few of them, looked at them. And because I was working um, with a colleague, Peter Ryder, who's very interested in medieval grave slabs, we tended to get distracted into the area of grave slabs to a large extent. Um, but not without some good reason. Um, because several slabs at Coldingham Priory and elsewhere, Long from Icos, for example, um, turned out to have an unusual cross motif on them, the cross of pain with peculiarly kind of um, cut off cross arms. Um, 
which seem to be of a 16th century type and provide some one possible link and seem to be also on roads to Flodden as well, um, or from Flodden. So provide a possible link to, to the battle and its aftermath there, but it's only a very possible link. Um, so, so most of the sites I'm going to look at now, the two or three, three or four of them, are ecclesiastical. The first was the Store Road, well, St. Ethelwerda's Chapel on the Store Road. The Store Road is an interesting road. It's a cross-border road. It's probably the only one that goes north um, into England. And it goes from Yetham and Yetham Mains over the border and, uh, towards West Newton and Killam. And on the Store Road um, is a chapel, St. Ethelreda's Chapel, which is mentioned in medieval documents up to about the 15th, 16th century. Um, its location, unfortunately, isn't precisely known. Um, Tom Broad of Bass, um, the Border Archaeological Society, has looked at this and came up with four possible sites, of which I think three are, three are still viable. Um, one, the middle one there, appears on the um, first and second edition Ordnance Survey maps. The top one is the one currently on the Ordnance Survey maps. Um, it's moved into England, as you can see. Um, so we, we thought we'd have a look around and see if we could find anything in relation to St. Ethelreda's Chapel and try to identify its location. Um, and here's the, the research committee peering from Scotland over into England. The trees are in England there, that's the border on the Holt of Burn, um, to see if we can find any remnants. We decided to not to look at the English site, to concentrate on the Scottish ones. Um, bottom left is Halfway House, um, a, a hostelry, a known hostelry of the 18th, 19th century, which is a, you know, a possible, it's also mentioned in medieval documents, um, and that may be one possible site for the chapel. What we looked at, however, were some earthworks, not very promising, I have to admit, earthworks um, in the floodplain of the Halterburn itself. Um, a linear earthwork, which is in the foreground, you can just see, and then a mound between the linear earthwork and the cattle there, a low mound. Um, turned out to be more promising than initially expected. Um, the, the picture on the top left is just a view northwards towards England, um, towards Shotton Hill, uh, up the Halterburn. The other three photographs show that there are wall remains in there with quite significant amounts of medieval pottery. So I'm not saying we found St. Ethelred's Chapel, but we found something related to it, or at least contemporary with it, um, and, and, and close to it. So more work there. All of these excavations were set up really as evaluations, just initial investigations um, to sort of assess the potential for further work on these sites. Um, next is Windy Windshield, which is a possible tower site. Um, and again, documented from at least the 15th century. Um, it's high on a hill above the Witterna Valley between Ellenford, which is one of the Scottish Army mustering sites, and I suppose Dunn's Coldstream, um, and the Scottish Army would have passed through there at least several of its campaigns um, to the south and then back again. Um, it comprises a tower, a probable tower to the west with rounded corner, or at least defensible farmhouse, a basil type structure perhaps, um, on the west side with a later extension on the east, and there's also a water mill attached in a peculiar position halfway up a hill. But again, the water mill is mentioned in the 16th century as both Flodden, as both, no, not a Flodden, as both a fulling and a corn mill. Um, this, so, it, and it operated until the 18th century at least, you know, despite being halfway up a hill. This is just a, a very preliminary um, survey of the, pre-excavation survey of the, the house. You can see the meter thick walls of this probable, possible tower at the west end and the later extension to the east. Um, excavations of some associated farm buildings, which we also thought might be uh, residential, turned out to be, uh, turned out they were entirely um, agricultural in origin, with, but with nice, you know, cobbled floors nevertheless. The, we, we looked at the cross wall and the junction between the two properties, the, the tower structure and the later structure, um, found yet another 19th century fireplace, good at finding those. Uh, and on the other side of it, um, which again, it's still a 19th century faced wall, but with on the bottom right there, um, a, a quern, a, what looks, a 42 centi uh, centimeter diameter quern of what appears to be kind of late prehistoric, perhaps slightly later origin. Also dotted around the site, 
lots of uh, cut mark stones. They don't look prehistoric. Uh, they could be ha holes for doorways, that sort of thing. Um, but there are a lot of smaller ones as well, two centimeters and five centimeter diameter approximately. And so any, anyone's thoughts on those would be welcome. So we didn't find here any direct evidence for 1513 or even the 16th century, but we did find um, a, an Edward I coin and uh, buckles of possible 16th century, 17th century type through metal detecting. So there's certainly activity there from uh, the medieval right the way through to the last century. Um, Abbey St. Bathans. We looked at Abbey St. Bathans as not necessarily a route taken by the Scottish army to Flodden because if you get into Abbey St. Bathans from the north, you don't tend to get out again very easily. So we think this is perhaps one of the sites that um, the Scottish army may have, or members of it, may have straggled into on its way back, um, seeking perhaps sanctuary and, and, and hostels, that sort of thing. Um, there are two ecclesiastical sites in Abbey St. Bathans. There's a medieval Cistercian nunnery, of which this is the um, chapel, only partly surviving. It's been heavily rebuilt in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, we excavated on the, well, all around it, on the, on the north side, which is supposed to be where the cloisters are, on the basis of some masonry being visible in the 19th century. We excavated also on a promontory to the east and came across some, well, medieval, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go as far as structural remains, but um, tumbled masonry, uh, amongst which was a lot of medieval pottery, uh, you know, quite significant amounts of good, well-preserved medieval pottery. So we've got medieval occupation um, to the east. We also found, curiously, five or six medi um, 16th and 17th century buckles um, in that area as well, again through metal detecting. So there's certainly activity um, on that side of the of the medieval kirk. We also looked at a, a second chapel site which was excavated in the 1860s, um, which is purportedly of early medieval origin and is dedicated to St. Bathan, who was a late, fifth, late 6th century um, um, monk on Iona. Um, it's been excavated in 1860. There's a very brief report published on that. We, we uncovered the walls, we didn't do anything destructive, uncovered the walls, uncovered what had been previously uh, uncovered, found a very distinctly late medieval grave cover, you can see in the centre of the first picture there, and part of a, um, a, a coffin as well, the head end of a coffin, which is actually written up, I think, as a, a part, part of, a, part of a, um, an altar or something. It's, anyway, it's clearly part of a coffin. Um, and in, the, in an account written by the landowner in 1870, he talks about it having been found by two workmen who uh, managed to smash it up because they assumed it was bedrock. In fact, one started smashing it up and then called his mate over to have a look at this nice chunk of bedrock he'd found. And they continued smashing it up until they realized that uh, it wasn't. Um, very briefly, Preston. We um, carried out building recording at Preston to try to ascertain its age. Preston looks very much like a lot of Borders uh, medieval churches in a state of some dilapidation. Some don't exist at all, like Moshoff, but most exist in that kind of dilapidation. They're being reused later um, in, as part of, uh, within cemeteries. Um, so that's some building recording. All of this work was done with volunteers, so we had volunteers helping to record and, uh, and generally supervise on all these excavations. And then finally, um, uh, well, within the last 24 hours, we've been doing work at Wedderburn, we were invited by the landowner to look at a small um, supposed family burial site um, on the Wedderburn estate. Um, and there, there was there's a med part of a medieval crosshead decorated uh, lying around in the undergrowth, so that was recorded. And then yesterday, excavating where those two people are standing, we found the, um, found the cross base, you know, well-preserved cross base about uh, six inches or so underground. So this is clearly a location. We don't know what it's doing there. It's um, purportedly the burial ground of some members of the human family, one of whom fell in a skirmish in 1497, and then two more who fell in 1513. So ironically, having found very little in the entire 
flodden project over the last three years that directly relates to the battle itself. You may on the last day have come across um, some artifacts which, which do in fact relate to people, being, people who were killed and then buried um, on that date. And this is, the, this is a drawing of the, the crosshead. And it would be very good if anybody can suggest, and David has already suggested actually, somebody who might be able to give us a better date on sort of stylistic grounds for, this, uh, for these decorative motifs. So very finally, just by way of advertisement, um, I should also say that we've got one more possible day's fieldwork on the um, Flodden project at John's Clough, which is way up in the Witter de Valley, another Scottish Army mustering site. Um, and that'll be, hopefully, we'll be doing some metal detecting there in, in August. Um, and then moving on to the, the next of our projects is going to be um, Peregrini Lindisfarne Community Archaeology Project, not our title, um, which is concerning the island of Lindisfarne and um, an area, a much bigger area, around the island on the, the mainland, mostly east of the um, East Coast Main Line, railway line. Um, it's a wider project, not involve, involving far more than just archaeology. So that's the extent of the, the project. The northern bounds run up almost to Berwick, the south, the south parts of Berwick, and in the south it runs up almost to Bambra. Now there's no, there's no particular, we don't have any particular we, we've just been asked to carry out interesting excavations with volunteers, so the scope is kind of open to us, or it's in a sense open to you, to anyone who wants to suggest what you'd like to see happening there. Um, in terms of background, I'm not going to go into this in any detail at all, but uh, Lindisfarne is well-known and well-resourced archaeologically. It has um, a well-known, well, prehistoric past, mostly in the form of uh, shell middens and flint scatters, Many of them looked at by Rob Young and Deirdre O'Sullivan in the 1980s and 90s. Um, but it's most famous for the, being part of the, the golden age of Northumbria, um, Bede and all that, or, you know, having been reported by uh, Bede, um, St. Cuthbert, St. Cuthbert's Island in the southwest uh, corner there. Um, unfortunately, virtually nothing remains in terms of artifactual or uh, structural remains of the Golden Age of Northumbria on Lindisfarne. Perhaps one part of the current um, church is of that period. Virtually nothing else, apart from some grave memorials. Um, but that's what it's known for. And whenever you see it, or you hear it being talked about as an early Christian or early medieval site, you see pictures of the, the modern priory, which, is, which dates to several hundred years after the early medieval uh, priory, of course. What was found in the 1980s, however, was, were these amazing structures on the North Shore at Green Shield, again by Rob Young and Deirdre O'Sullivan, then of Leicester. And these are, these are amazing 9th century um, early medieval houses. And they still survive. And if you want to go and see a 9th century stone-built early medieval house, you still can because they're, they're still surviving in the sand dunes on the north side of the island. So, you know, people talk about the golden age of Northumbria and talk about the, the Priory, but in fact, the best things to see of that period on Lindisfarne are these fairly humble domestic dwellings. Um, what we're hoping to do and what we will be doing on Lindisfarne over the next uh, two years, a variety of archaeological community ventures, uh, guided walks, workshops, earthwork surveys, field walking and test pitting, um, we've already got people signed up for these, but I'm sure we've got vacancies if anybody's interested in learning more about archaeology or, or, take, or having a nice time on Lindisfarne. Um, looking at historic buildings, um, there are a wide range of historic buildings to choose from. A lot, there are a lot of listed buildings on Lindisfarne. However, there are also a lot of really interesting buildings. Uh, potential Battle, for example, which is actually the middle of those photographs rather than the bottom one. Um, which isn't listed, not written about. Um, got Osborne's fort, um, a later a post-medieval fort, opposite the current, opposite the castle, the famous castle of Lindisfarne. Um, and that, as I mentioned earlier, there is a possible pre-conquest ecclesiastical wall on Lindisfarne, and that's it, the left-hand side uh, photograph there. When that wall was stripped, it reveals features which suggest, suggest its um, pre-conquest. 
So that will be recorded. Okay. And very quickly, excavation, you know about excavation, some of, them, some of which will involve lime kilns, if you like lime kilns. Um, these are what we're going to do this summer. So we've, first of all, we've got a site at Scremston in the north, lime kiln site. Then we've got um, some 19th century, 18th, 19th century cottages at, on the north side of the island, site B. And then we're looking at the, the Huf, which is the area adjacent to the uh, castle in the south part of the island, where Rob Young and Deirdre Sullivan produced this plan of earthworks and geophysical uh, anomalies in the 1980s, showing all sorts of things, some of which have been looked at by Hope Taylor in the 60s, um, and maybe early medieval, and we're hoping to have a look at those in June. And finally, this is what we're planning to do. The first two events we've had, um, the rest of the excavations we're still to do, and then will be a a whole range of other excavations later in the summer and next year. Thanks very much.